access to technology is important and it's a big thrust in general in education in Ontario. Um, there is uh, provincial funding that's available called Special Equipment Amount, SEA funding, that will pay for whatever technology is recommended for a student. Um, there's some great examples of how school boards are um, putting software on all of their computers so that all students can work together on projects with the built-in accommodations. Um, many um, examples of how that special um, differentiation is done to work on projects and so on. I like this framework around knowing what, acts, what technology to try for a student when you're aiming higher you know, in terms of their academic abilities. Um, you have to look at four things. The student, and who knows best is the family, the student himself. The environment, that's where the teacher provides the input. The task, that means that the teacher is communicating to the, the whole team, including the student and the family, what, um, what is required of the student before deciding on a tool. So I think this, this encourages teamwork rather than to say, I know someone who has um, Kurzweil or whatever it might be, um, I want that for this student too, um, to get all the heads together and look at a very unique combination of um, how is that going to work in this environment, in this class. Um, I have some examples of things parents can say, a worksheet for parents, um, in explaining what technology, uh, why technology will be important for the son, and da son or daughter. There's so much that's available, um, but what's crucial is, what's critical is the attitudes of the team members. So if there's been an assumption made that the student will not gain academic skills, as unfortunately is part of that developmental disability um, definition all across Ontario, but where people don't overcome that um, dangerous assumption and perpetuate that negative attitude about student learning, it's no wonder they don't if they don't provide technology. So it's really about turning those goals around to make sure that, that you, you, that's again where I see the importance of removing all alternative expectations and zeroing in on um, either grade level or expectations from the Ontario curriculum. So um, uh, uh, the ministry says that if a subject is accommodated only, that the student's achieving at grade level, there doesn't need to be an IEP page for that. It may be helpful to have that because it may be um, provide more specific um, suggestions about when and where and how that accommodation relates to the actual um, curriculum material or time of day that, that a student may need more um, accommodations around um, glare in the afternoon when the light comes in a certain way in the classroom. But for modified expectations that are from the Ontario curriculum, there must be a section in the IEP for each subject. There will be annual goals and uh, learning expectations for the term. It's important to be clear about the grade level of those goals. Um, which, which piece of the Ontario curriculum scaffold are you um, climbing over now? one at a time in, a, in some kind of logical order that works for this student. The report card should reflect um, whether or not that particular goal was gained. Um, so it should relate to grade level and um, student work that's done. Um, it's important though to connect not just with the grade level the student's working at, which will not be the grade level of the regular class, um, if that's the case. Um, because um, inclusion means that you're working with the same lesson, you're working with the same classroom materials to the highest degree possible, even though you're using that lesson and that uh, material to gain knowledge from another piece of it, through another piece of the curriculum, not the same. You're, you're doing the activities for a different reason perhaps, than the other student is doing. So I like to see phrases in the um, modified expectations that say things like exploring um, selected concepts in age-appropriate class curriculum. Um, so that uh, there's, this, this is where an IEP, where it's really strictly following the ministry directives around grade levels and communicating grade levels and building step by step. Um, can be too discouraging for the student um, and it can 
um, encourage the teacher to separate the student from the class. So there need to, need to be some ways to build a bridge towards why the student's in the regular class and how they can meet their needs there. Um, it's also important to, in determining whether or not the student met the goals to um, be clear whether or not the accommodations were in place so that we're not failing the student if the team failed to provide the accommodations. The last part of an IEP is the transition plan. Um, uh, again, since 1998, it was required for every student with a disability aged 14 and over. And it's, it's, um, it can be used in a really positive way. This link on the screen is to the ministry's um, transition guide, which is from 2002. And it encourages uh, community partnerships and uh, teamwork. There are some positive quotes that you can use if you're not experiencing teamwork with the school around transition plan. Um, the, the law refers to transition plans addressing work, further education, and community living. We mean that in the broadest possible sense. We mean career development. All too often, all I've seen on transition plans is a statement such as put the student's name on the list for a group home or a day program, um, a day program which might no longer even exist or where there are no vacancies. So um, it, it can be discouraging if that's all that a transition plan's about. Um, uh, I'd encourage teams to think in the broadest possible way about career development and that the student's path in life um, that where the student really wants to go, that we make sure that his experiences and his subject choices through high school, his co-op experiences, summer jobs, are moving him in that direction. The legal responsibility for an IEP, um, uh, it's, that it must be completed within 30 school days. Uh, I'm very discouraged because the provincial auditor has found that um, typically they're very late. Um, the, the auditor found that um, a half of uh, um, secondary school IEPs that in the sample he looked at were late and that the average lateness was 17, seven weeks, which meant that um, uh, for half the students in high schools, the IEP wasn't even completed until mid-December where the semester ends in mid-January. So it's very discouraging to hear that kind of data, but it tells me that Schools, these schools' experience has been that an IEP is not very helpful. But even when it is written, it's stored away. So if we can work with schools as teams and as in a very positive way, because this IEP is the student's ticket to the future, um, and if we can make the IEP more useful to the teacher, then I think they'll be done sooner and people will care more and then the whole standard will in in improve. Um, the, the law requires that the consultation with parents and older students, um, that doesn't mean that they just sent it home when it was completed. Um, the, uh, the legal um, uh, definition of consult with is that there's the broadest possible sharing of information and decisions. So it's not just enough for parents and older students to provide information but they should be part of the decision-making aspects of the individual education planning process. So um, if you have found that that has not happened, there is supposed to be in every IEP a section for parents' comments, and that's the place to comment on what it is you wanted the team to, to know that you were going to say and the fact that you didn't get a chance. It can be helpful to keep a paper trail of your advocacy to write letters, um, you can write a letter after the IEP. If the IEP was sent home and your input was refused, then you can write a letter to anybody you want within the school board, all the way up the system. You can copy that letter to others. You can draw attention to that problem. Um, and you can be very clear in your communication about that now that you know what the law requires. Um, and again, it's important to in, in the, as the IEP process is wrapped up every reporting period to consider what's written in there about student needs and how they will be met in regular class because that's the crucial factor in, cons in the placement decision being made at the next um, IPRC if the student has been identified. Um, that placement is to be in accordance with parental wishes and your wishes should be um, recorded 
um, either in this parent comment or elsewhere in the file. The provincial auditor is very keen that parent input be recorded. That's one of the political um, contributions made by that review. So to sum up, um, one view about creating change has been that there should be five agree ingredients for change to happen. There must be vision, there must be skills, incentives, resources, and an action plan. And if any of those are missing, we're not going to achieve the change we want, and we're going to experience frustration, and we're going to feel like we're on a treadmill and nothing ever changes. There are ways that IEPs relate to all five of those things. A vision can direct the IEP. Incentives can drive the IEP. An IEP is an action plan. An IEP determines what focus to have on skills and the skills the team needs, the human resource skills that are needed. Um, IEP promises resources. It says the resources to be received by the student. So when we're talking about IEPs, we're talking about all those things, but an IEP alone can't resolve all of those.